Okay, we're here at the California Antiquarian Book Fair in Pasadena, California, February 8th, 2020. And we're here with Carl Plomgren. Plomgren, let me say that That's right. Correct. Fine books from Petaluma, California. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. It's great to see you this morning. Um, tell me a little bit, if you will, about where you were born, where you grew up, your family life, the beginning of you. Yeah, I grew up in uh, New York City in, uh, um, in the Bronx. And uh, I went to Bronx High School of Science mm -hmm. and grew up in a house full of books, which probably had something to do with what I'm doing nowadays. I bet it did. Yeah. My father was a, uh, a book accumulator. Okay. I wouldn't say a collector as much. We like those. <laughs> but he kept building bookcases in our house. It filled the hallways with bookcases, the living room. So I was surrounded by books and I, I loved books myself. So. What kind of books do you remember loving when you were a child? Um, when I was a child, I, I read uh, I'll, voraciously. I read, uh, I got into different things, science fiction, fantasy. Tolkien was a huge when I was in uh, junior high or middle school, depending where you are, but it was mm -hmm. called junior high in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friends and I loved Tolkien. We were drafted up, up, we were gonna make a little movie. <laughs> and then I was gonna be Tom Bombadil, but I was very disappointed when they made the uh, actual Tolkien movies. I left Tom Bombadil out of, this, out of the movies. They, they should have consulted you. <laughs> yeah, I could have told them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that sounds like a very colorful, evocative, um, literature-rich childhood. Did you, when did you go to school? Did you go to college? Did you carry I, that through or? Um, yeah, so, I mean, as a child with, in New York with my dad, we visited a lot of bookstores because mm. he was always loved books. So I got exposed to a lot of bookstores you saw the scene. in downtown Manhattan. But wow. then I went to college in uh, Southern California, okay. here in Southern California. I went to University of Redlands. Okay. And um, four, I was an engineering major mm -hmm. at first, studied engineering, physics, and physics. And then I, uh, I got interested in psychology and decided to transfer up to San Francisco State oh, okay. as a psychology major. And then I stayed in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and got interested in uh, a lot of different things. Uh, worked as a carpenter, learned the trade of carpentry and became a general contractor mm. and um, did fine woodworking. But I always had an interest in the book business and I started uh, dealing in antiques and books um, on the side, so to speak. Okay. Remembering back to those days in New York, is that what was that what kept that interest, that vein, through you, the passion for that? Was that just I think so. And the woodworking, seeing and having an appreciation for things that are made well. Um, yeah, you could say that. That's a good um, description. I enjoyed craft, fine craft, okay. um, and books, fine books, illustrated books, particularly appealed to me. Do you remember some of the stores, going back to the Manhattan childhood, remember some of the stores that your father brought you around to? Because what a circuit you had to visit. What decade um, was that? That was when I was very young. It was in the late 50s and then the early 60s. Wow, what and an era. I, um, I remember Gotham Bookmark, mm -hmm. and I, there were a bunch of... I think it was Fourth Avenue in New York had a, a row of old bookstores. I, I don't remember any of the names. I guess Argosy was still was there then. Strand. Probably. Was there I then. just yeah. wasn't paying attention to the names then. Of course, you were you were a child just taking it all in. <laughs> but the a bookstore that I do remember in uh, Yonkers, which is right north of 
the Bronx, mm -hmm. Yonkers, there was Alley Cat Bookshop. Oh, wow. So Alley Cat Bookshop, he was a publisher and uh, had his uh, a bookstore. And he also, um, he published some poetry books, some kind of, um, he might. Uh, small uh, press fine books? Yeah, sm very small press. And he was a bit of a character, but I remember buying a book there that I thought of as the first time I actually felt like I was buying a collectible book. Really? And it was Kurt Vonnegut's uh, Player Piano. Oh, yeah. Because I, at that time, like I said, I liked science fiction mm -hmm. and Kurt Vonnegut, I loved his stories. Loved uh, So that was kind of the first book I remember buying that I thought of as a collectible. That was the seed. There's a difference between buying a book you want to read mm -hmm. and a book you want to you keep knew it was special. as a collector. Oh, that's awesome. Do you still have it? Yes. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Um, so now back to California. You're, you're working in um, with woodworking. You're working as a GC. You start selling antiques and books. What were those first books that you were selling? How did you find them? And well, then how did that transition into you now, Carl Bromgren, find books? I was, um, I was interested in illustration and I liked comic books too. Okay. So um, at that time, uh, I was friends with Bud Plant, Ken Sanders. We were all in the, in, we were all liked comic books and we were actually probably the first fair I ever sold at was a comic book convention mm -hmm. and Bud Plant and Ken Sanders also ABAA members mm -hmm. were um, we were young sellers of illustrated books and comic books because there was a crossover but yeah. in the art world mm -hmm. in the, for us and then gradually I got less interested in comics and more interested in the books but illustrated books were what really was what I started to specialize in okay and has that carried through to now what what would you define now as your areas of specialization your range I guess I call it uh, uh, fine books with a focus on design and the arts mm. so that includes illustration mm -hmm. it includes uh, fine art it includes architecture design, photography, and um, graphics, prints, posters. So pretty mm. broad Pretty broad, area. but pretty, it lets you deal in whatever you feel really compelled yeah, to work with. Yeah, but it is, it, it, a lot of it has to do with um, compelling design mm -hmm. and uh, images. Well, and that, we're seeing so much of uh, that influence in the shift in the market towards a visual graphical nature of the material. You walk around a book fair these days and everybody's face out and picture first and we're, we're a visual culture now. Yeah, so and I think you're well positioned. Well, there's also, um, what I see happening nowadays is also, uh, 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 it's been, happening for several years, of course, but ephemeral things are of particular interest. Yeah. So um, posters, graphics that were, I liked a lot of posters, which usually were printed um, ephemerally, you know, printed for a certain exhibition mm -hmm. or a, an event. Yeah. And then not reprinted, except in rare occasions when it's particularly desirable, mm -hmm. they'll do a reprint of it. But um, these are these points in time that as an ephemera dealer, we can we can save it. And, and uh, otherwise it was, you know, it's torn off a pole. It's it's ripped down off a marquee. It's it's right. It's, and those um, things that uh, it's appealing to have a, you know, a little point in time that you're able to uh, focus on and the history and the the design. 20th century primarily for you? Yeah, 20th mm -hmm. century for sure. Modernism, postmodernism, uh, counterculture era very, and forward? Yeah, or? A lot of counterculture. Okay. Um, but I like, you know, um, what you 
could call the classic poster arts from the 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, the European artists, mm -hmm. and even back to the real uh, poster revolution in the turn of the century. I've dealt in some of those uh, posters too. You know, the early, like Toulouse Lautrec mm -hmm. and um, great artists like that, Mooka. Mooka, yeah, that's beautiful stuff. And it always comes, it stays in favor, but then it comes back around with more strength sometimes. That's true. Um, so you mentioned Bud Plant, of course, Ken Sanders. Right. The, the icon. Uh, would you consider the mentors? They were peers for you. Who are some of the mentors as you've entered as this iteration, Carl Blomgren Fine Books, that have really, it sounds like you're a man who is d decisive and carves your own path, but who's well, influenced I've, you and helped you? I've sort of self-taught mm -hmm. bookseller. I would never worked for any of the big names who, you know, I mean, a lot of our compatriots learned the trade from working for, yeah. uh, you know, some of the great booksellers. And I sort of learned on my own, but observing the, um, you know, visiting stores that you know, John Howell and okay. um, a lot of the great bookstores, but I can't say I was mentored by any of them. Mm -hmm. I just sort of pretty much self-taught. Yeah, <laughs> and saw what they did and it all percolates in and, yeah. and your voice comes out. Yeah, that's good. That's a good thing. And how do you let that voice uh, be known? Uh, you're doing fairs, you're here. Do you do any other fairs? You put out a catalog? Do you have an internet presence? Um, How does that voice reach? My business currently is on Abe, A-B-E, mm -hmm. and um, I list books there. I do this show, uh, you know, the California Book Fairs I've been doing now regularly for, I think, about 10 years, ever since I became a member. And I've done occasional other West Coast shows, Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do the Sacramento Book Fair regularly, which is a smaller book fair, but it's yeah. really a fun uh, book fair in Sacramento yeah. twice a year. The Jim K show. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I've delved into, well, now there's the rare LAX shows that Brad and Jen are doing. Yeah. I, I, I'll, do those when I can and used to do the shows that Bustamani would produce um, sometimes his book fairs but I've always stayed on the west coast I haven't okay. haven't ventured east <laughs> do you find this visual material really needs to be seen in person uh, do you do you send out lists but it does it you know how do you does it need to be seen it, Scale, seems to sell nature. best okay. at shows for me. I mean, when I I list some visual stuff online, I uh, it doesn't it doesn't seem to move doesn't basically translate. as well as if I take it to a show, people see it and um, fall in love with it. I guess <laughs> the wow effect, or the yeah. you know sometimes institutions will. Um, discover me at a book fair mm -hmm. and uh, they'll buy uh, from me. But um, I haven't done any catalogs recently. Okay. So um, that, that's always a possibility. <laughs> Sounds like it would, the material would make for a really beautiful presentation. Yeah. Um, if you, uh, looking forward, um, the state of affairs, the state of the trade, a little forecasting with me. Where do you think we're going as, not as an organization, but as, as sellers of culture, as guardians of culture, as finders of treasure? How, how, what do you think the future holds? Well, that's a good question. Um, um, it's hard to predict. I mean, things yes. happen, things change. Um, I'm a hopeful person. I always kind of feel like uh, there's hope for the future of the business. I see a lot of excitement from um, the people, my customers. Are, there's, they don't seem to lose enthusiasm for the material, even as they're building 
you know, large collections. They still love finding something new. That passion. And then uh, I see a lot of younger booksellers. I used to be like the young guy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now I'm one of the older guys. And uh, But I see a lot of bright young booksellers coming into the business. I think it's very uh, encouraging. And your buyers, are they changing? Are they, they're, 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 they're maturing I, into their, you know, collecting, becoming more sophisticated, but are there, are there young ones coming in behind them? I would hope so. I still have, it seems like the core of my trade is in uh, recurring customers okay. um, who've been buying from me for years and uh, you know they're you know pretty much friends now it's beautiful <laughs> but uh, no every once in a while there'll be a young collector or just a person who suddenly discovers an interest and uh, that's always really encouraging it's exciting when they see that this world exists when they didn't know it right it's yeah like they looked uh, behind the curtain and said <sighs> I didn't even know. Yeah, this you was see here. people come into a show like this book fair, and mm -hmm. they're like, "Wow!" Yeah, <laughs> it's like, the whole world awaits them. Yeah. Um, if if you were a, that younger bookseller again, and the whole world of the trade awaited you, what advice would you give yourself? What would you do differently? What are some of the challenges that you would want to know were ahead? Oh, I, that's a tough one. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of regrets, so I'm, I'm not going to say I do. I enjoyed what I did in the, you know, in fine woodworking and building. I did a lot of projects that I enjoyed doing. And you could say that maybe I would have been... Um, had a bigger footprint in the book world if I hadn't been doing that. Yeah. But I enjoyed that part of my life too. And sure. uh, I'm, you know, I don't have regrets. I suppose, if anything, um, maybe I sh doing more catalogs might okay. have been, um, uh, you know, a productive thing to do. And maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe it is a productive thing yeah. now. Okay, so yeah. one thing I would hope to develop this coming year, 2020, okay. is a website with um, featuring a lot of things I'm interested in. Okay, yeah. So that would be a goal for this year. <laughs> that's, that's a good goal. We'll check back in with you and see. All right. That's a great goal. But I, it sounds to me like you basically are uh, affirming do what you love and don't have regrets. Makes, um, a, makes a pretty good business and a pretty good life. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, Carl, thanks so much for sitting with us today, telling your story. It matters. And right. we're happy to hear it. All right. Thank you, Cara. Thanks. It's um, been a pleasure.